know you can hear all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hemodynamic monitoring three, and I've given you your. Um, everyone's got uh, a hand up. Lovely. All right, so what I'm going to do first, and I'll have to remember to click down here, is just to revise some concepts which really are about the homeostasis in terms of shock and being able to adapt to shock states. Debbie probably covered a bit of this, but I'm going to look at it from different terms maybe. And you might remember we talked about preload, and this is the right side and all the things that influence preload, um, of course, the venous bed and venous pressure, <coughs> uh, the atrial and ventricular compliance, being able to stretch and receive blood, the heart rate, of course, if it's going very fast, you can't feel, uh, and inflow resistance. So if you've got um, an atrium which is stiff and not relaxed, it can't feel. So, uh, and we talked about breathing and how that changes pressure from um, negative to positive and how we can actually draw up blood from our legs that way. How muscles contract and keep blood moving. Gravity, if we put our legs up, we get a better venous return, uh, etc. Now this happens also on the left side, but instead of coming from the body system, it comes from the uh, pulmonary bed and so again we have what the pulmonary venous pressure is, how much blood's in the pulmonary veins, uh, the atrial and ventricular compliance and of course heart rate and then we go over and things like inflow resistance which is actually called afterload as well. Uh, we have if the heart is stiff of course it doesn't feel and then you may remember the waves that we get when that left side contracts and the waves that come back from it and of course if they, those reflective waves, if they come up and the timing is bad with a contraction, you'll have that obstruction as well. <coughs> After load, I've really there again, we uh, talk about very similar things. And contractility um, is very important because um, even if you've got a heart that feels, uh, you've got to sort of pump it on. We then looked at factors that affected cardiac output. And of course, this is quite complex. Just to refresh you, over here we've got cardiac output, which is a combination of heart rate and stroke volume. Heart rate, of course, has um, your autonomic nervous system innovation and some hormone influence. Of course, the atrial reflex too picks up on how fill, filled, how much blood there is and that stretches, so if you don't stretch well, you'll have a higher heart rate. Uh, okay, so if we go back and forth here, we have to have the volumes, end diastolic volumes. There's preload and contractility, which we talked about, and preload was affected by the things we just mentioned. Contractility by your nervous system and, again, some hormones. And we can see the relationship between mean arterial pressure and cardiac output. Because uh, systemic vascular resistance is really, really involved there. And if you put it down to a smaller uh, thing, you can see stroke volume times by heart rate times by SVR is really where your map is. And uh, so, now oxygen saturations in the heart, if you're taking it from a pulmonary artery catheter, and SVO2 um, on the yellow side, it's 65% is normal, but if you're taking it from the central line, the 70% 70, 70 is the normal figure that you look for. And these show all the pressures throughout the heart, which are normal there. Okay. Again, the, uh, which you all know and love very well, is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, baroreceptors here um, on the heart and the aorta and the carotids. 
uh, sends messages to the brain stem. You get vasopressin, which stimulates the kidneys. Uh, we also have an angiotensin converted to angiotensin 1 to 2 in the lung. Sympathetic response, which causes vasoconstriction, as does a bit of angiotensin 2 there. We get um, your uh, sodium changes uh, and we have feedback loops. So um, all those things that we know and love. Now, if we go to natriuretic peptides, they actually work in the opposite. So they're the, the yin and the yang of, of the RAS system. Uh, and natriuretic peptides, there's A from the atria, the C from the vascular endothelium, and B from the ventricles. Uh, and you can see they suppress the renin angiotensin and endothelium, which are vasoconstrictors. Uh, and what they do is um, they increase, also increase um, naturesis. So really the, the other side to the coin there for the RAS system. Now, did Debbie go through inflammatory response? Yes. Briefly. Briefly. Well, I'll, I'll just briefly mention it too because it's very complex and when we do sepsis I'll probably go into it a bit more. But and I've given an example here that inflammatory cytokines, which are the result of inflammation that, that when you cut yourself, you get inflammation normally for that to heal. But critically ill patients get inflammation that becomes systemic. And there's lots of reasons for that. One, they may be in a condition of pre-morbid state for example, diabetes or, or heart disease, that already has high levels of inflammation. Two, they may have some genetic chain or changes to their um, DNA, which doesn't block inflammation, so they already have a high inflammatory sort of state, or maybe they have an autoimmune disease. These are the sort of things you've got to think about. So critically ill patients all have something in common they have an inflamed total body state. But what that does, it actually impairs function of different organs. And it's very hard to measure, apart from looking at C-reactive protein, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, those sort of things. And inflammatory cytokines, for example, if someone had a myocardial infarction and they've got some damaged myocardium, what happens is we don't just have damaged heart, we also have inflammation with it, and that does the damage because even though there might be a tiny bit that's damaged, it actually, the, the inflammation that happens here stops all this heart muscle working as well. So quite often if someone has an inflammatory response, and often it is to shock, you'll find that their heart won't function and often you'll get for example if someone goes and has cardiac surgery and then they come back for a couple of days for no real reason their heart is very sluggish it just will not kick in you still need a lot of inotropes and a lot of fluids and things like that they're the sort of patients that have an inflammatory response which actually suppresses cardiac function so um, that's in a briefly in a nutshell I think, and we'll go on and look a bit more at it. Now, I'll put at the back of your notes just a list of these, calculation of cardiac values. You've had this before. <coughs> and you can see uh, what the normal values are. That's just handy to have. Um, normally, when we work with these numbers, we have reference to what's normal, so that's great different things that, that we can look at. I'm not going to go through all of those right now. Um, but also what is used locally is the oxygen use variables, which um, are quite important to know if you're doing oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. And we've got up here um, arterial oxygen Content, CaO2 is content, DaO2 is delivery, 
and VO2 is consumption. And that's really what we're looking at, oxygen uh, consumption. And the oxygen extraction is something which some intensivists like to see. Because oxygen extraction, especially in someone who has um, a lot of inflammation, the actual cell on the mitochondria in the cell actually can't suck the oxygen up, so it sort of goes through the system, even though you've got them on the PaO2 might be great or reasonable, you can't, they can't extract it. So they're actually ox oxygen deficient at the cellular level. So that oxygen extraction is actually really important for patients who are really, really sick. Now, you can see you're all going off to sleep from this. this is this is hard. So, no, I didn't practice my tap dance, I should have. Anyway. Now, Guyton, blood volume distribution according to Guyton. This isn't new. Um, I've already talked about where the distribution of blood is in the system. Um, okay, so you can see most of it's in the venous reserve, which is 65%. But, what I want to point out here is that the venous reserve is actually has two compartments to it. One which is an unstressed volume, which just has to take up a certain amount of capacity. That's a word. <laughs> and above that is a stressed volume, which is what actually drives blood flow. And we know very well that shock is about lack of perfusion and lack of oxygen uptake. But if we don't have enough blood volume here for it to be under a stress sort of situation, you're not going to get blood flow. And there's lots of reasons for why that might be. Okay, if, um, for example, if someone's bleeding out, of course the volume will drop down. Or if they've got distributive shock where they everything widens out and this still this goes down here. So this stress volume you'll find is is actually manifest by the sympathetic nervous system and it's also if someone has um, noradrenaline running that will make this part under a stress system as well. So that's how 